on breath. We had, for those who are uh, seeing us from outside, we had a wonderful morning session on body and a wonderful practice session on body. And actually, Lama Willa will be the moderator of this panel. So let me hand it on to her. So welcome, everyone, to the afternoon panel on the topic of breath. And that is the also the topic of communication, speech, and and the subtle breath of prana, or lung. And we're going to start this panel off with the presentation and work of Alejandro Chao, who is the, um, well, you may have to introduce yourself. <laughs> I'm, I'm spacing out at this moment, who's also an old friend and <laughs> a wonderful yogi who works um, in the Houston Metpo Center and will be um, talking to us a bit about bon breath-based practices from the Himalayas to the clinic. So talking about his research and the intersection of this topic of breath with the um, world of healing in medicine. So thank you, Ali. Thank you. And so what I'll do in this next uh, 15 minutes or so is um, uh, prepare us for some of what we've been doing here from Ligmincha to different centers uh, within the Texas Medical Center, with, uh, which, as a friend of mine would say, it's the largest medical center the world has ever seen so far. <laughs> and so, but within that, um, I work at MD Anderson, which is, as you can see, a cancer center that is trying to make cancer history, and that's that. Um, the McGovern School of uh, Medicine within the UT system, as well as the School of Nursing, and now working within, within the Jung Center's Mind Body Center, Mind Body Spirit Institute. And so, uh, there's, as you know, whenever you do research, there's a lot of people you need to thank. So, I want to do that first so I don't uh, leave it to the last slide. So, I want to thank so many people, but in particular, my teachers. So uh, Lopon Tenzin Namdak and Tenzin Wanja Rinpoche, as well as His Holiness Lungto Tempanima, have been so supportive, not only to have taught me, but also to support in the research. So when I started doing research at MD Anderson, Lorenzo Cohen, who's the director of integrative medicine there, he said, what about starting a, a research uh, program, a clinical research? And as many of you know, I come more from the religious studies area, and so I didn't know what clinical research was about. And the first thing I said is, let me ask my teachers. And when I asked them, they were so, so supportive. And Rinpoche in particular, thank you so much for all these years of, of support. The other thing that was happening was the whole dialogues that were going on um, uh, with that what then became Mind and Life, and actually we're delighted to have Wendy here representing Mind and Life. And, you know, they started actually in a smaller place, like we start too. Like they started in a living room of the Dalai Lama. When uh, we were just coming, the presenters, we were just having a conversation with Rinpoche in his living room. Um, and so what, what was going on? 20-some uh, years ago, uh, through mind and life, starting this idea that spirituality and science can be complementary. They don't have to, uh, they're different, but they're a, a, a another way of doing complementary approach of seeking the truth, of expanding the horizon of human knowledge and wisdom. So this is an area that was important that this was happening for the kind of work that we did. The other thing within the Tibetan tradition specifically in terms of research on these practices is Herbert Benson. 
And actually, Herbert Benson in his, uh, of course, he might be very well known also for the relaxation response, so many of you may know him from that, but also his research on TUMO. And interesting enough, since we are close to UVA, and UVA is one of our partners, one of their uh, partners of research with Herbert Benson is Jeffrey Hopkins, right, who used to be here at UVA and actually one of my professors as well. And so he did probably the, the, the first study with Tibetan practices that were breath-based, and what he noticed is that this practice of heat that was coming, and this is probably a little different than the warmth and the way that we're talking here now, this heat was actually being able to be done through mind-breath practices. And actually, as you can see, he published it in Nature, which is a very reputable uh, journal. And this was back in 92. So this is kind of one of the first studies on this area. The other thing that was happening is this whole area of integrative medicine. And we have uh, many of you, uh, like um, Dave and Ruth, that are working in integrative medicine. We know um, that the idea of integrative medicine, and Ruth mentioned some of this earlier in her presentation, is that it's not just about the body, even though it was presenting about the body, but the idea of health is not limited to biomedicine. And in a way, this goes back to another uh, very seminal paper in 1977, George Engel published in Science the need for a new medical model, the challenge to biomedicine, and in a way, he proposed a biopsychosocial model where health is at the intersection of the physical, the psychospiritual, and the social. And in a way, that's what happened when I came into MD Anderson and um, uh, it was called Place of Wellness at that time where I started working that then, uh, through the efforts of Lorenzo and many others, became the integrative medicine program um, that has a clinical component, a research component, and an education component. And as you see our model, it is totally based on George Engel's model. And so we have the physical, the mind-body, and the social, and the optimal health and healing is at the intersection. And one of the things that it's important for us is that optimal health and healing is looking for what also are important outcomes from that. So that the idea is that the practices that we do become evidence-informed. Sometimes they could be evidence-based, but at least evidence-informed. And so within the mind-body practices, uh, this is uh, the um, definition that NCOM, the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, uh, had, which is now called the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health. So it's a variety of techniques designed to enhance the mind's capacity to affect bodily functions and symptoms. Now, from the perspective of the Tibetan tradition and many other traditions, it's not just mind-body. It's really this mind, breath, body, mind, energy, body, we can use this term cell, um, as the encompassing both for breath, for lung, as well as speech, not. And so kind of in the talk that yesterday as, as it opened, Rinpoche opened, um, and um, dialoguing with Michael, we, they touched upon these triads, and, um, and it's something that is very important because a lot of times in the medical community, they only talk about mind-body. So I think it's important to have this, not just for us to have this breath panel, but to have this understanding of this energy component, both as the sense of the field of interaction of mind and body, as well as it expresses through breath and speech. And in a way, also what's important within these traditions, and I'll take it from the Mother Tantra, from a specific text, uh, but other uh, texts also explain this, how in a way the breath is like the, 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 or the winds are like the horse, and it's a, it's a wild horse. It's a wild horse that can nurture us in the inhalation, it can uh, cleanse us in the exhalation, but it's wild and it goes in all different places. So if we don't guide it, this wild horse can go everywhere, right? And so we need somewhere to guide it, the rider, the mind. So the mind becomes the rider. And where does it go through? Through the body. So that's where the mind guides the breath through the body, as we were doing, for example, in the nine breathings that we did with Rinpoche yesterday, in the practice that we did this morning as well. And in my own work, I was working with 
the Tsalung Trung or this Tibetan yogas, particularly from this text from Shart Satashi Jansen. And I was working particularly in this area of how these practices were done, but also how can we apply them in the medical center. And I see Ngawang in the back. Thank you, Ngawang, because thanks to you, I got many of these texts from the library that without you, I wouldn't have gotten. And, um, and so with the help of uh, Rinpoche, and we met with Lorenzo Cohen, we started designing the first studies on Tibetan yoga. And the first one that we did was for people with lymphoma. And why we did people for lymphoma? Because the text would say, do it with lymphoma patients? No, actually we did it with lymphoma because one of our, of a student of Rinpoche who was part of our Sangha, Alma Rodriguez, worked at MD Anderson and she said, let's do it with our patients. And that's how we started. And so we did uh, our first pilot study with people with lymphoma and we did the second pilot study in women with breast cancer. And one of the things that we included is, of course, the nine breathings, right? The, the breathing through the right and letting go of aversion or anger through the left and the whole area of attachment and the central, the confusion. But also the incorporation of the channels, something that it's been interesting for me in this research as I remember talking to Tukten Jimpa, one of the um, translators, he's on his Dalai Lama, and are the channels something that is religious or can they be secular? So in a way, and now that we have Punzo Wamo talking afterwards as well, is I felt, I felt, well, they're part of the medical tradition in, these, in, in our Tibetan medicine. And so I think it's important to keep the channels as well. And in a way, this is the practices that we call in a broad way uh, Tibetan yoga, but it's Salung Trungkor, using the tsa, the subtle channels, the lung, the vital breath, or prana, or chi, and these movements, the trungkor. And as um, uh, you know, and, and, and maybe again, related to Tibetan medicine, the five kinds of winds, or the five kinds of lung, that, uh, for example, when we're doing the tsalung this morning, we were working with these, exactly these five kinds of, of lung, each one having an exercise to guide, to help guide the mind, guiding the breath through the body and supported by the movements. And there's all these different um, uh, correlations that these five lung have in Tibetan texts. And so we created a, a seven week uh, um, program using both the Tsalung and the Trungkor. And we did this for this group of people with lymphoma. We had seven sessions, meaning that we, and we did assessments in baseline, one week post, one month post, and three month post. And in 2004, we published our first paper. And in that paper, what we found, we published it in Cancer Journal, and we found that uh, the main outcomes that we found useful for the people who practice versus those who were in the control group were that they slept better. Better sleep quality, better sleep quantity, better sleep latency, which means the moment they wanna go to sleep until they actually fall asleep, and less sleep medicine. So, uh, but the other part from my own, what I was really interested is that in the references, we were able to have the Mother Tantra, the Shangshu Ninju. So this was where I was really excited, you know, as a religious studies scholar, it was like, look, now we can get them in cancer journal, right? In scientific <laughs> journals. Um, and then thanks to those, um, to those studies, we were able to apply for a grant at NCI at the National Cancer Institute, and we received uh, over $2 million to study the effects of this Tibetan yoga in fatigue and sleep in women with breast cancer. And therefore, we were able to do a three-arm trial, meaning that we had a control group, an active control group besides just the standard of care. And the active, active control group was actually a control group that um, was stretching. And stretching exercise is taken from um, a manual of women with breast cancer recuperating from surgery. And for example, one of the movements, you know, we did this morning like this in the Tsalung, one of the movements in the manual is like this, right? So we were trying to pair the movements, par pair the m amount of attention that the instructors gave to the patients. And, um, and we also, we went down to four sessions because this were mostly for people, for women with breast cancer that were undergoing chemo, chemotherapy, and chemotherapy's regimens changed from the time we did the first study, and that's why where there were seven sessions 
to four sessions. Instead of being weekly sessions, they became monthly sessions, and so that's why we did it uh, shorter. And we also did three booster sessions. And again, we worked with the channels, which was something that we decided on purpose that we, it was an important part of the practice. So we did include the subtle body, as Lama Willa was talking, and um, also Rinpoche yesterday, the Tsa, the Lung, and the Tigle. And um, so this is another uh, brief way of thinking of the channels and the five chakra system that we work uh, within the, the Tsa Lung. And uh, finally, two years ago, we were able to publish the results of that uh, grant. And basically, what we found is almost like a dose response. And what we find is that the, the same issues that we found, like a reduction in sleep and so forth, were able to be found only in those who practice two or more, uh, sorry, more than two times. So those who practice two or less times didn't get those effects. But if, you know, kind of the average was 2.3. So if, you've, if you practice at least three times, then the effects were there. And so in a way, that's important from the clinical perspective of how they're saying, well, you at least need to practice three times a day because as some of you in my clinicians know that that's the question that your patients ask. And so then we said, well, we talk about connection from meditation. What about interconnection? Something that we started talking before too. And together with Catherine Milbury, who's a social psychologist and actually presented in this conference before as well, uh, we decided to uh, kind of unite our forces and look into the connection both as a, from the meditation perspective as well as the diet, the patient and caregiver. And in a way, if we go back to our model, kind of that social component. How is that part of helping in the health? And in a way, so we did a Tibetan yoga with uh, lung cancer patient and their caregivers. And in a way, um, at the beginning, we would teach them by being in front, right? Like what we usually do have the people that are learning in front of the instructor, and then what we ask them is, now when you practice, turn around. Practice facing each other. And what we found that was interesting were twofold. One is clinical levels difference, both in the patients as well as the caregivers, particularly in the areas of fatigue, sleep, and depression, but also something that we weren't measuring in that way, but we were videoing and we were looking at is, their relationship. And one of the things that we found is as they were practicing, one of them would reach with the toes to each other or would reach with the hand to each other. This sense of connection. And so that's also an important part of what we found. And um, again, we were able to publish this in uh, Psych Oncology. This, we call it the couple-based uh, Tibetan yoga program. And again, finding similar issues in terms of less sleep disturbance, sleep disturbance as well as mental health, uh, as, as, as well as the active uh, aspects that I was mentioning for both groups. And what's important that it's for both groups is many times we only focus on the patient and we focus on the caregiver just as a sense of support for the patient. But in this case is the caregiver also suffers. And so helping both. Finally, a little bit about nga, a little bit about speech. So we did a, a study on uh, sound and we decided to do it with women who um, after having breast cancer and undergoing chemotherapy had what something that you call chemo brain. Right, and chemo brain is really um, kind of cognitive impairment after the chemotherapy. And we did, again, collaborating with, uh, with Rinpoche, uh, we did a study that focused on the warrior syllables, but using specifically just Aum Hung. And so uh, in this study, one of the things uh, that happens is that, for those of you who don't know the practice, is that there's also a cognitive engagement. So besides the sound itself, there's a cognitive aspect of clearing with the ah, of connecting with the om, of bringing with the hung, and that's why actually uh, the, psych the cognitive psychologists were interested in this. And again, we were able to publish it in Psych Oncology in 2013, and two of the main outcomes were, one was increased um, short-term memory in those who practiced the, the Tibetan sounds versus those who didn't. And the second one was speed memory function, like using the Stroop test. So 
Um, and then there were, again, uh, increase in spirituality as well and other, uh, other findings, uh, but, but those were the most important ones. And we find that in our clinic, so now we have a clinic, a meditation clinic, where we incorporate these practices, and we also measure, and we find clinical significant differences in anxiety, in fatigue, in distress, in improved well-being, sleep, depressive symptoms, memory, and pain. And in a way, that's what our clinicians want to know, that if we have increase in this area, that's why they would refer to us in that, in that way. Finally, um, the study on um, stroke. So uh, this is a, a study that I don't have data yet. We, are still, we just finished um, the last cohort of, of um, patients. And these were people that, after stroke, uh, felt that they were too lonely, depressed. And we decided to use a breath-based approach, uh, very similar to actually using stillness, silence, and openness as well, though, so the three doors practice, um, in a, in a four-session uh, uh, practice once a week. And so hopefully soon I'll get to let you know the outcomes. And so in a way, if we want to simplify things, you know, many of you know this formula, stop, right? So S for stop, T for take a deep breath, O for be open and observe, and P for proceed. And maybe we're not ready to proceed, and we need to take another deep breath and be open before we proceed. This is something that we also bring in because it's a simple way for these people to incorporate in their daily life. Again, something that we were talking in this uh, conference about simplifying things. And what I want to point out is, yes, we're talking about breath, but this part is really important, this being open and observe, kind of leading to the, the next session that will be on mind. So in a way, the other part that is important is that we have resources for people. So we have a website where we include these practices. We have, these are, when we do the practices, we, we do the research, we bring them back to the clinic, we use the power of breath, we use the sounds, we use the movements. And, um, and as I said, we have it in our Integrative Medicine Center in the website, and this is available in English and in Spanish uh, for everyone, right? So you could be in Timbuktu and still be uh, learning these practices, or if you come to MD Anderson, you learn them, then you go and practice them there. So in a way, what I like to say, it's like, you don't have to be in the monastery on, or the caves. Um, uh, this is Menri Monastery, uh, so where Rinpoche um, was trained. And um, you can now come to the clinic, right? And so you come to the Integrative Medicine Clinic. Yeah, you have your doctor, Gabriel Lopez, our medical director. And we have, they refer to specific practices as well as group practices because that's also part of that social component. And now, of course, faculty and staff are saying, what about us? So in a way, as we finish, it's like being back in the mandala of Medicine Buddha, right? And in a way, you can think of Medicine Buddha as that being, uh, enlightened being that knows about the suffering of all beings. And so he or she has access to understanding the suffering of everyone, but also access to all the different practitioners that are needed with all the different medicines that are needed. In Tibetan, mandala means gilkor, right? Center and periphery. So there's a dynamism, almost like a pulse, like a breath that goes from the center to the periphery and the periphery to the center. The way I see this mandala too is that at our center is the patient and the caregivers that we're looking for that health, not just physical health, but psycho, bi biopsychosocial, spiritual health. And that here, it's like what we do at our IDT, which is our interdisciplinary team meeting in integrative medicine. And so, in a way, this is our massage therapist, and this is our acupuncturist, and the oncologist, and everyone around the table thinking of the patient. And in a way, within the different things, we were talking today about the three pills. So the Tibetan medicine of the three pills. And, and so stillness, silence, and openness. And one of our students of the three doors made this, which are actually mints, so they're not pills, <laughs> right? But it's another way of remembering to take your three pills, your 
medicine. And I know we're going to have Punza Wamo, who's a Tibetan medicine doctor, so she'll be part of the panel. Um, and I hope she's okay if I talk about this briefly. So thank you very much. <laughs> So our panelists for the breath panel, responding to Alejandro's research, are Dr. Punso Guangmo, who is a Tibetan doctor who is highly trained in her field. She teaches at the Zhangzhong Institute and has worked in Asia, a charitable nonprofit that sets up hospitals and training centers in remote areas of the Sichuan province and the Chamdo prefecture. And Tenzin Wangyo Rinpoche, who is a highly trained lineage holder of the Bon tradition and founder of Ling Mincha International and its centers here. He's also the founder of the Three Doors, a nonprofit that teaches Tibetan methods for everyday life, and the Lishu Institute, a center in northern India for intensive training in Bonn. And Dr. Alejandro Chao, Introduction 2.0, <laughs> Director of the Mind, Body, Spirit at the Jung Center in Houston. And he's also Director of Research for Lingmincha International and had a lot to do with organizing this conference and has for years. Um, so I want to start by inviting um, Dr. Hunzo Wamo to um, just to get the discussion going to talk to us a little bit about the concept of long mm -hmm. um, in Tibetan medicine and and the kinds of long that exist, uh, the different categories mm. to get us started. Thank you. So first of all, I want to say thank you. Uh, now? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm very honored to be here at the center and to meet you, all of you. A lot of talented people, so which is great. So, my answer was the Lama Willow's question. So, the Tibetan medicine, when we're talking about the, the Lung, Lung, I think there's many translates, but it's simply is translated into this is like wind element. So Lung, I think these days you also practicing Lung. So when we're looking like a simple Lung, when we go outside, there is wind comes, boost our mind, sort of like face. First thing to make a little bit fresh, refreshing. And then also a little bit of dry skin later. And then also causing sort of like a little bit suffocated, sort of like a breathing. And then meantime, it's sort of like to making more active, energetic. So this is sort of like that the rough lung, what we see in the outside externally. But same as like this kind of lung in our body. So. In Tibetan medicine, which is a Gyangum Jesu Chawa Pedak Lu, so most of like actions included opens, closing, sense organs, or the organs and the movement, stretching, contracting, lifting, lift, everything sort of like most of activities is done by the lung. So this is when we look in general. So in general lung, as the Dr. Chao, they said, is like that breathing. Breathing is one part of the lung. Thinking thought is part of the lung. All the movement, the circulation is a part of the lung. And also, like energy is a part of the lung. So lung is, there is a lot of things, as said, is most action done by the lung. But when we look in the lung, there is five subcategorized lung, 
to seating different parts of the body and the different like a territory and then governing the, the, the different parts of the body and their actions. So the first lung we call is the, the Sok Zimbe lung, so the Sok Zin lung, like a life-sustaining lung. So the life-sustaining lung is like located on the crown chakra area. And then that lung sitting here and go down through the throat, down to the chest. And then the function is when we eating food to help the soul of the food. And then also help us to sort of like to forming the uh, so also like uh, help us like inhaling the breath. And when we want to spit out something like uh, like a sputum, this kind of make us action to take the action to spit out. So those kind of like uh, action done by this that the song jing lung roughly. And then the more subtle level of this song jing lung functions also all the sensor organ perceptions and the governing all the, the sensor organs. The second lung, which we call is that the king lung. So the translate they say is like the ascending lung. So the first one they call the life sustaining. Second one we call the ascending lung. So the ascending lung is we call the kingu. So kingu lung is basically generally located in this the chest territory and specifically located in the throat chakra. And then this lung goes up to the through the toes to the, the nose, nasal area. So we call the kingu lung So this lung give us like a speech, like form the speech words, and also giving the complexions, strength of the mind, the body, and a particular strength of the voice. And then also to help us the clarifying the memories. So that lung we call is a kendu lung. And then the third lung, which we call is a kapji lung, so they translate this as a pervading lung or pervasive lung. Kapji lung ne ning le ne lugun kaba yoshi dengjo do kyangum jetsun chawa peralu. So the kapji lung is located in the heart, on the physical heart, or the heart chakra. And then goes with all the, the circulations of the, the whatever they need to circulate. Mm. So the simply is like circulation, the, the blood circulations, lymph circulations, energy circulations, whatever need to circulate it through the body. So that lung, and then the most of like a body, mind activities included the sense organ is connected to that lung. And then the fourth lung, which we call is the menyam lung. Menyam lung is they translate this as a fire accompany lung. So that lung is like located in general abdominal area, particularly is that the connections of the large and the small intestine. So that area they located that. And then that lung comes up so like that wind like pushing that the digestive heat to restrain the all the metabolic system and the particular digestive system and then time comes to digesting and the time comes to digesting melting metabolic need to work and then that lung goes up and then to push the fire to make it more stronger and then they helps to digesting so at that time is not only that the digesting, but also helps to dividing pure and impure mm. systems. So we call as a meta nyabelung the power the nangju kundu kyuji senju chi. So so that lung is like a fire company lung moves whole like the abdominal digestive system and then to help to digest and then dividing pure impures. And then the last lung, which we call is Tursi lung, like the descending lung, and some translate also this as a down cleansing lung. 
so that the loan goes to, to up to down, down gate. So, to to save a loan is young land along the Gamba Samwa land and you could have changing in Jindum Che. So, that loan is located in the pelvic area and then uh, that goes into the, all the lower abdominals, included inner thighs. And then that loan is mainly function of the governing all the uh, activities, lower gates. So, like if feces, urine, when we need to go to the bathroom, so sitting to the toilet and then the urine comes or there's not possibility and the holes. So all those kind of actions, the time comes, release, and then not time comes, not possibility to hold. Everything is done by this loom, included like menstruation cycles, uh, like ejaculations, and also uh, like childbirth. So all those kind of thing is like a connect to these five looms. So what are we saying in this case? This the five loom sitting in the body, different parts of the body move different territories, and they're working. And then A they has a job, independent job, but B they're working as like the, the team. So when we're looking sort of like a um, healthy person. Healthy person means is that the physical body is functioning, mind, you know, mental level is functioning, plus is energy level is functioning. These three functions together, then we call is a healthy A person. So this is that sort of like the, the standard to making like healthy, unhealthy according to the Tibetan medicine. So the Tibetan medicine itself, is a very holistic and they're also like an integrative system. So Tibetan medicine, when we're talking like the, the theory of the Tibetan medicine, like body, mind, energy is like interrelated, interdependent relationships. One of them is dysfunctioned, then our name is not a healthy person, something different name. For that reason, this three is important. So when we're looking sort of like the, this morning also roughly mentioned this, the five elements. So this, the wind element is wind element. So which is that the light, mobile, energetic, subtle move. So this is like wind. But this wind needs to work with earth element because earth is sort of like the base. If there is no base, just wind, then everything blew out. There's nothing functioning. If there is wind, light, mobile, energetic, so on and so forth, if there is no fire element, it's wind is too cold, too dry, too rough. So there's nothing productions. For that reason, it's like a five element we call is like Njungwanga. Njungwa means is sources, origins. So among this origin is wind is, the lung is the one of them, and then not one of them, but is the first one, sort of like after the space, is sort of like first one who creating everything. So when we're looking like this, that the Song Jin Lung, an example of this, that the life-sustaining lung is dysfunctioned. Many of us, and in particular when we're getting a little older, senior, and then we end up eating like that the liquid food. Childhood, there is like children food is more like liquid food. And then senior people's food is another sort of like the liquid formed food. Why we do that? Because our life sustaining lung is weak. That way also we're losing the memories and they're losing like the growth, a lot of like the white hairs, and then also sense organs declines, and then included comes a lot of like wrinkles, so on and so forth. Meantime, also we're losing the actions to solo food, movement, because at that time the song zin lung, like pushing down, is the weak. So for that reason, is we're not able to eat certain food. And then King Yu Lung, if the ascending Lung is a disturbed time, particularly when we get older or when we have something physical problem, 
then our voice is not strong enough. Our voice is sort of like shaking, looks like you're talking nearby the wind, sort of like. Mm. So what's that happened is, is that our ascending lung is aggravated. And then also a lot of today we have this, that the children like what they call autism because the slow development of the voice, I mean, the, the speech. And then when they're talking, but it's like stuttered. So this kind of we have, and then another one is after get the stroke, or after we get a certain, like the like life-sustaining lung is damaged. And then if the life-sustaining lung is damaged, and then the vocal also, like that, the, like a king lung affected, so this kind of time, what we do in the Tibetan medicine, yes, we do have many treatments, so we say like a 98 methods of the treatment, but it's lung, when we come, to, come down to the lung, sort of like, nature of the lung is light, rough, subtle. So then what we do is we treat like the warm, oily, and the more heavy. So like this is sort of like the antidote because it's treatment means it's antidote, no? Antidote means it's opposite nature to come down the other one. So if there is wind comes to blow out the, the papers, put some the heavy things on the paper and then they keep it down there. So this is like the antidote. So this way we work. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. then, if you have more questions, then later I will explain. Yeah. I'd like to invite Rinpoche to respond to um, either Alejandro's or uh, Dr. La's comments. And in particular, what was I was curious about um, thinking about just listening to um, Dr. Punzo Wamo speak is that the lung seems to be the place, the energies and the body seem to be the place where um, mind and body meet, that there's some kind of bridge happening there. Um, I wondered about, about that. And also, because in, in this conference, we've been talking about body, breath, and mind, a little bit about what is the relationship between breath and the energies that Dr. Punzo Cuomo is talking about here. Well, thank you. Uh, I think there was a wonderful explanation of five long. Maybe I wanted to start, maybe say a little bit what Alex was uh, giving presentation earlier of, on five, uh, mm. five long. That is exactly what Dr. Punso was explaining in more detail, just to, I'm sure everybody mm -hmm. knows that, but they're connected. And uh, so uh, the all the researches that we have done in, in, in Houston, they're m most of them, I think in some sense, they're related to the effects of wind. So either their cognitive ability in the brain or you know, sleeping better or whatever, the, the benefit of this exercise are, I, th I think that they are actually caused by a shift of the wind or, or the, mm -hmm. the lung by exercising or by sound. So th I think that's the relationship there. And I think just generally this notion of uh, that uh, the breath or wind or prana affecting our health, or uh, I think that's something that I think many, many people are interested in, and I'm certainly very interested. I think the breath and the prana is the one of the future, important future medicine, I believe. And uh, I mean, the more and more you see the meditation is affecting different forms of health, but the reason why meditation is affecting health is because even the mind that when attention of mind, when it draws attention in a different places, you don't have act active rhythmic breath, but there is a breath there, there is a life force there, there is a presence of wind there. So that's why 
it, why attention effects, I think, because there is a wind. Uh, because I think that the, 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 I think important to make those connections. And um, like in our tradition of as a spiritual practices, we always think about, you know, why, the, why important the wind is, why important the prana is, uh, or why important that matter body is. So you're trying to control something which you, is very hard to control by controlling something which is easier to control. So what I'm saying is mind is very hard to control. So stop controlling mind, but control your body, which is easier to control, or, if, or control your breath, which is easier to control. So when the mind, body and the mind both are in the right place, mind will be fine. So if you're trying to force mind to change mind, mind will never change. Mind always does something other than mm -hmm. what you want it to do. We know this, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, 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 I think it's a, in, the, in the Talung practices, we call sometimes like a outer, inner, a secret uh, breath exercises. So, uh, so for example, this exercise is what, what uh, we have done in the hospital there. So one of Talung exercises like this related to the heart. So when you're moving, holding the breath in, holding in the heart, when you're exercising. Of course, the only movement is hard to hold, so you can see how your capacity to hold the breath is not easy. Some people say, oh, I cannot do it. But you can do it, but if you have to practice, right? So when you do that, it's the actual breath, it's the actual air. So in the air, that is where you're activating one of the, one of the wind by exercising uh, in the heart, with the physical exercise activating specific wind in your heart for, for the health of heart. So it said in the fact that the soloing exercises, it says uh, they say it's, a, it's a practice of longevity. Basically, it's a, it's a cardio exercise, unlike like in the gym, add awareness on it. There's a awareness <laughs> an important part of the practice. So, or you don't do that movement, but you're simply doing the breath. For example, you, you breathe in, hold, no movement. So you're doing nothing, basically holding the breath. I mean, you're doing something and expanding your heart, lung, holding as long as you can when you cannot. Breathing out is a simple rhythmic breath associated to heart exercising one of the wind elements. And what, what that does is definitely uh, it's a heart, practice, heart health practice. So it's a cardio exercise in some sense. Or then you don't even do the breathing part very much. Breathe normally so you just whatever level of breath you're doing, what you're doing is simply an, an attention. So that means you make sure your mind is just simply focused here. And that's all you're doing. Simple attention at right place. It's not simple attention only, but simple attention at the right place. Like in this case, heart. So when you bring your attention to the, your heart, that attention or that awareness, I think, activates something in the heart. I think maybe like a social mm -hmm. connection to what you're talking about, you know, like holding somebody's hand or, or a Zen meditator looking at the wall. But there's nothing to look at the wall, but you're looking at yourself with the help of the wall. <laughs> so so it's, it's the somehow connection to yourself or connection a specific area like heart, which is very important part, is, is activating something. So that activation is called like a secret wind. Secret wind, in a sense, is not movement, it's not rhythmic breath, it's just simple attention, and it could be better if there was more awareness, open awareness, rather than a focus, limited, effortful awareness. So I think there is a, a role, lot of important role and all, you know, these, I think, I always think 
it's, it looks like uh, you know every time we hear from some researchers, it's saying, okay, one research saying, okay, there is one answer for, one meditation answer for this problem of health. There is another research saying, and, you know, there is another answer help for this, this problem. So in a way, you can have whole hospital based on these meditations. No pills, no drugs, no <laughs> injections, no operations. Just come and do different meditation. I think that's a, I think it would be nice to have a place like that in the future. <laughs> That's, true. You, yeah. That's true. That's <laughs> yeah. true. So, I wonder, um, Alejandro, if you could talk a little bit more about what is it like to introduce in a hospital setting these practices of energy. Mm. And how is the medical establishment, establishment where you are receiving that? Um, I just, I, keep, I can continually find it extraordinary. Every time, like even just that slideshow, that that's happening. Yeah, so um, when I started 20 years ago, and now it's very different, right? So uh, when I started 20 years ago, um, First of all, as I said, uh, I also had some trepidation. And, um, and it was thanks both to someone within the establishment, um, um, Alma Rodriguez, and, uh, and the support of, of our teachers that I said, OK, maybe we should try it out. And they were open to say, let's try it out. Let's do it. You know, let's try it out for six months. And 20 years later, we're still here, right? <laughs> and so, uh, what happened? So, so that was one part that they were open to at least try it out. Um, and for me, what brought me to that specific place was, well, I did have a connection because my dad had recently been diagnosed with with uh, prostate cancer. Actually, Namka Nobrimpoche had been re recently diagnosed as well, and that was the same year. And so, I had something like, I want to do it here. You know, so, so I had a connection that I wanted to give to that specific place. And I, you know, I came as a volunteer, and, and that's how I started. And then when, what I think the, the big thing was when we were able to do research. So when Lorenzo Cohen said, would you want to do this clinical research? And, and you know, and of course, you know, asking Rupert <coughs> who, bless you, yes, setting, you. Uh, who gave me the trust, uh, you know, to say, Let's go for it, right? And so when we did that, and actually I remember uh, one of our first meetings uh, with Rinpoche and Lorenzo was in, the, uh, in Washington in the first, uh, uh, first conference of, they call it the first international uh, conference of, Tib of Tibetan medicine. Although the Dalai Lama, when he opened it, he said, actually, Thank you for inviting me, but this is not the first. The first one was in the seventh century. But uh, uh, be, besides that, when we were talking, I remember Lorenzo asking Rinpoche, I said, so what would you want to measure if there was one measurement? And Rinpoche, you know, for a moment paused and said, open-heartedness. And this sense of open-heartedness. And Lorenzo's response was, um, okay, we can't measure it now, but he was open to say maybe in the future. Now, by having this combination, for me, was a sense of trust. I have people within the medical establishment, people, my own teachers, and so that was one. The other part is that the, the people that were receiving it, the patients and the caregivers, were delighted that we were doing these practices. And, and the aspect of breath, that was, you know, in a way, sometimes I started with saying things such as, well, you're all breathing, right? <laughs> but you're not conscious of it. So this, you know, and, and it sounds very simple, but really this bringing the attention, bringing the mind to the breath that we usually don't, it really makes a big shift. And so even starting with simple things, Noticing that, as Rinpoche says many times, even, okay, let's have the stillness of the body. There's a difference between having the body still and being aware of the stillness of the body. So really bringing this awareness. 
And, and so that part for me uh, was very important. The other part was, yes, the medical establishment at the beginning were kind of rolling their eyes, you know, saying, what is, you know, what is meditation here? And because of Lorenzo, because of the research that we were doing and finding outcomes that were important for the doctors, that's when the doctors started looking in a different way and then started saying, what about us? We also want this. Because they're looking at the evidence. They're looking that their patients are saying, oh, I did this practice and this really helped me. And that's when the doctors even change, I have to say, sometimes they change more because of that that from you know uh, a longitudinal st a study or you know epidemiological study you know they 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 want when their patients are saying I am benefiting on this so that's uh, I think the combination of the clinical and the research was very important and for me personally the support that I had both from the teachers and even from the people within the hospital mm -hmm. so it was a teamwork. So in probably both Tibetan medicine and also in the practice of Dharma, um, there's an understanding that, um, that this category of breath is also a category of speech, mm -hmm. uh, voice, yes. speech. Speech. Yes, speech. Nga, like yeah. Yeah, the lung and the nga mm -hmm. are connected. And so just out of curiosity, um, so in our culture, and probably in every culture, <laughs> there are some people who have an easy time finding their voice, and then others who really have a difficult time finding, finding their voice, um, especially in our culture, I think, for women, that were raised maybe to be a little more quiet. Uh, I hope things are changing a lot, but uh, what practices can we do to help strengthen our connection to voice and to help um, find our authentic voice or maybe our dharma voice even, or whatever you might say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so I think, as I said before, to finding a, your dignity probably that that means. So to caring the yourself to, you know, utilizing whatever. So this is not only that the wind element, but also we need the fire element. So as I said before, that the Tibetan medicine is everything like interrelated, interdependent relationships. So the fire element we need it. So the fire element, the functions of the fire element is sort of like to give you courageous dignities, self-confident. So we need these kind of things. But then another one important for that, I mean the earth element, fire element, wind element, water element, those kind of like, the earth element say, okay, stable, sit here, think about well, sort of like. And the fire say, okay, we move. And then wind is bringing a lot of ideas and then fire sort of like follow up. So this kind of the works as a team. But then another one important is that the, in the with Tibetan medicine, we call them dang. Dang is that the one of the most pure essence from the digestive process. So to getting into the dang proximally takes about a week. Like today's breakfast, next Monday, then get into the dang. So this ndang is like, ndang means it's sort of like race, you know, like the, the, the race of the light. So this one is a sort of like also part of like the, the immune systems, what I'm thinking. But and then looks like much more than immune system they does. So once we have a good ndang, and then this ndang gives you a lot of like confidence, a lot of like self-dignity, self-confidence and then energy, so. And then how we get the good and down, of course, so one, we need to eat good food. One is it not only the eating the food, but also we have to have three digestive system as well. So like the earth element, the composing well, 
fire element cooking well, wind element dividing well. So this kind of, we need a three digestive system well working there and they produce the dung. And then once we have the good dung, then we have all those like the easy to getting the, your voice to the front. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and then also not only in that, but also like the, if you have like a good dung, and that also can prevent a lot of like the uh, contagious disease, and then also like a provocation problems, and then to sort of like, if we have a good dung, looks like wearing a good arms for the body to protect him from all kinds of like the uh, disease or the attackers. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> at the dung, yeah. it's like a glow. Yeah. So it's like yeah. an energetic glow. Yeah. Uh, so if if you, you know, somebody in the skin or face, yeah. or you see the glow is there. So it's saying the effect of that. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so your question, um, in some sense, when we, I'm mean, trying to stay with that speech and the wind mm -hmm. <laughs> topic here. So um, when we say wind in each element, like I so saw that we're saying fire, we need a fire. Uh, so the fire has a wind. The wind element or the prana, it's in every element, right? So if there's a... Mm -hmm. Earth wind, fire wind, water wind, space wind, air wind, each of the mm -hmm. elements. So somehow that uh, in order to have a glow in the body, you need all the elements more balance in the body. If you, in order to have glow in your speech, that means f fully mm -hmm. spoken out rather than mm -hmm. hold, suppress, fearful, yeah. or rather than glow in your heart, in your mind, will be just uh, fully able to kind of imagine mm -hmm. or express. Uh, uh, so that sense of, uh, I think, in the speech that uh, Dr. Punso was saying earlier about upward moving wind or that mm -hmm. chinjulung, it's somehow related to the speech. So in practical sense, where we're trying to, this is the practice that we do in the three row practices is First, we're trying to recognize if there is, if you're holding back something, you know, recognizing the condition, recognizing your pain speech. Maybe you're not recognizing you're not speaking enough. Or you're or recognizing maybe you're saying something different than what you feel. Or recognizing that you're suppressing your speech. Recognizing your voices could be more powerful, strong than you're expressing it. So some sense of recognizing what we call, or even recognizing that what we call pain speech, you're just complaining about everything. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people just, if, if you talk, they will say you're talking. If you don't talk, they say either you're not talking. <laughs> you, we all have a friends like that, right? <laughs> no matter what you do, they'll find a way to complain. <laughs> That's called pain speech. So, but they, when they do that, they don't recognize they do that. So recognition of that pain speech, and then uh, with that awareness, you work with this upward moving wind, with salon exercise, bringing more attention to your throat, feeling whatever the blockages are there, exercise trying to clear it, and then after clearing it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to kind of rest, really like you're trying to rest, after clearing the blockages of your voice, resting deep in silence. So the deep level of your connection to your own inner silence is the source for your voice, your speech. And from there, you will, you will find a different voice. You will find a different speech. You will find different words. You will find the power in those words. I think that the ability to find that, and then these exercises, I think sometimes they all have to do with related with the wind, lung exercise, you know. Yeah. One more question before we open it up. <clears throat> so this is for any of you. Um, what do you think the correlation is or isn't 
between the uh, Tibetan idea of Lung, of prana, and the, the um, neurophysiological idea of the nervous system, um, do you think these are the same or different or kind of overlapping? Um, how do you understand it? Any of, Neuro, you, any of you. Neurophysiological system. The whole, you know. So, I don't know enough about the neurophysiological, but I don't know if... Uh, uh, so, that means physical so maybe you want to say what it is first? I'm not an expert either. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, I know that in... Uh, ooh, I know there are some experts out here. Ruth? Uh, you want, yeah, would you just quickly, like... Maybe give us a quick little snapshot of nervous system. Um, yeah, and then you guys correct me, but it, it's um, so the the nerves uh, are a major communication system between the brain and everywhere else in the body. Yeah, mm, that's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and actually, so, I so oh, is good. it is it like a more what is this, substance-wise? Is it like a air, blood, air, oh, well, um, so the tissue, nerve, oh, nerve el electric? What, what is it? It what? uses chemical and electric. Ch chemical, chemical and electric, and okay. Yeah. So the nerves are also tzas. They're mm -hmm. also channels, but instead of, mm -hmm. uh, of travel, what travels mm -hmm. inside, instead of being lung, is this other uh, mm -hmm. substance. Sometimes they even say, and correct mm -hmm. me if I'm wrong, Kunsola, the, the veins are also tzas. They're all different channels. They just carry mm. different uh, substances. And so in that way, there's correlation. But I don't know if, mm. if, if there's a direct correlation within the Tibetan yeah. medicine. So from the I'm not exactly sure is the, uh, the Western point of view. But in the Tibetan medicine point of view, the tza, tza means is it can be all the channels. And then also, theoretically, it's, that means it's root of the body. So that can be is major, like the, the white channel, and then the black channel, like the nerve, and then the blood system, and the included nerve system. So this is like the more like the physical part. Inside that the physical tsa, who is the traveling, and the, like the vehicle, like traveler is that the lung. Lung is like traveling, like a vehicle. That vehicle is who is carrying into that vehicle, and then like the, the red channel carrying the blood systems, white channel carrying like the, the lymph systems, so, and then the energy system. So that is, we say, is like the, the tsa is a nerve, or whatever that the, the channel is like the, the road. Lung is like that the who's going into that the road. And then the like the passenger who's sitting in the, that vehicle is that the the old who need to go to the, the bodies, including like the circulations. Yeah, it seems like a, well, probably I think first of all I think it's a very interesting yeah. question yeah. that all these scientific terms and yeah. <clears throat> the, the Asian Tibetan medical spiritual terminology, trying to find, I'm always in, curious about it, but hard to know what is what, you know. <laughs> so I think a very interesting question. But generally, my sense is that I think definitely they are connected, you know, yeah. like so, for example, um, the heart, human heart. So every different cells comes out and produce more cells than one knows to become a heart and one nose become a lung, and one nose become a liver or something like that, they don't do much of a mistake. They don't say, oh my god, I'm supposed to be the heart, I became a liver. <laughs> so we have one extra one here. You know, Those kind of errors are not, doesn't happen in our body. There is inner intelligence because of the wind. Mm -hmm. Wind actually pushes to, it to become a particular heart, particular kind of heart, particular limitations, ability, so a human heart rather than other heart. And so I think those are like what we call karmic wind of forcing to become a particular being, human being, particular human being, 
to have give particular heart. These are creation of human whole body is creation of force by wind. And these are karmic wind, uh, conceptual wind, and therefore, I mean, that the whole idea of, you know, uh, neuroplasticity, or all, all, same thing. The wind is sh changing it. Clearly, the wind is changing it. So what kind of wind, how, these all are interesting discussion, no? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. It seems that it's the wind that travels through all the tzas, even if it is the nervous system, and it helps, as Dr. Punzola was saying, as Rinpoche, carrying whatever substance is there, but what is carrying it is that, that wind. So there is a sense of lung in whichever way, uh, gross or subtle, um, that is helping that substance ca be carried through that um, through that uh, tsa. What's interesting too is that in some of them, the mind has, or, or the what we calling the mind has more of a role in it, like the writer of, so you're doing that, and others, it's happening, right? It's happening through the nervous system, it's happening through the system that things are moving, that our brain is growing and whatever, but we're not really in control. So that, another interesting thing. Yes. Is it better, better that we are not in control? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. Why don't we open it up here to uh, comments and questions? Hello. There's an emerging measure called heart rate variability. I don't know if any of you or anyone else is researching that. I've just started researching that myself. It's, it's come out of work in sports medicine, mm -hmm. training of athletes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the heart rate variability uh, related to your interest, Rinpoche, and some measure of open-heartedness. It's interesting to me in terms of the approach of training what's called uh, co cohesiveness in heart rate variability, um, which is achieved through breath and breathing from your heart and getting your uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems in balance. When that happens, your heart rate variability um, from beat to beat, the variation, um, is accompanied by help from the brain in expressing gratitude as you breathe through the heart and appreciation and this openness and a kindness feeling. Again, this has come out of training athletes where their performance improves when they improve the cohesiveness of the uh, variability, heart rate variability measurement. Um, that's one thing I'm researching currently that might relate to this question of how the nervous system and the mind working through the heart uh, leads to wellness. It's also from HeartMath Institute. Yeah. It's been around a long time. They've got some interesting, the old biofeedback or the human psychophysiology devices that really facilitate. Yeah, they do. I have the app. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have shown that mindfulness training does increase heart rate coherence. I had a question for Dr. Um, Ali, in your presentation, you one of the ways that I understood what you were talking about with the results of these physical practices that there's really a sort of a balancing or a harmonization of the winds. And so these patients have gone through really kind of radical procedures are restoring this balance of sleeping better and feeling better. And Rinpoche, you also talked about how when we allow the body to rest, it begins to heal. When we rest in the silence of the mind, it begins to settle and it begins to heal. And so, because I know almost nothing about Tibetan medicine, I'm really curious, as you talked about the winds, when you're seeing a patient and you find an imbalance, do you use physical movement and meditation and breath work as treatment, or how do you treat a patient when you're trying to restore different kinds of imbalances in the winds? Thank you. So, we do use uh, the treatment, and generally we have four different types of the treatment, like diet, behave, medicine, external therapy, so this kind of. So as it comes to the...
you see, comes of the treatment, it's noisy. <laughs> 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 so, like the, once it comes to treatment is the, the number one is like the diet is looks like important. As I said before, like that the nature of the lung is a light, rough, mobile, subtle. So they need something that the food which has, like also the nature of the lung is cold. So we need that the food which has like the heavy, stable, warm, oily, so those kind of food we need. And then the another one also like the external therapy, so sort of like a oil massage, compress, salt compress, so those kind of also is important. Another one is like the also medicine is important, like supplement, but more important is that your behave. So the behave is like physical behave, mentally behave, and verbally behave. So all those kind of like that the simply is talking not too loud is one treatment for like that the lung imbalanced. Instead of talking too much, is talking a little less also is a good one. Instead of listening, <laughs> instead of like listening a lot of like a, a loud, noisy music, sort of like some of those music is it looks like a little torturing yourself, you know, too loud. <laughs> instead of listening this kind of music and listening something like a gentle, soft music, or talking something nice, not like a politic talking this kind of. <laughs> And then another one is important is the breathing because the breathing is like a food is try to balance the, the element, but is like the the food processing to the the things take approximately 24 hours, but the breathing is immediately. So then another one is important is that the breathing things like a deep long breath. So this kind of yes, I do use all of them. Uh, tried advice to all of them. And then another one is important also, like, like meditation. Today the meditation is becoming a very successful antidote for the mental disabilities, sort of like who has like emotionally problems. Because it's like the emotion problem is like your wind element too high or something happened, unstable that will lead you sort of like to anxiety, to this, to that. And the meditation is, if things calm down, as Rinpoche said before, is the mind is not easy to control, but it started with the physical body. Body through, first you try to control the body, then try to control the, the breathing. Through that, then the, your mind, without no one supporting your mind, is not so many things to do, automatically settle down. And then once that is settled down, because this is like good antidote for the wind, because wind is light, mobile, something heavy comes down, so your mind keeps on the ground. So this is that the helps. Yes, I do. Thank you. And sometimes you also do uh, refer to, you had told me, Tsalung and Tsunkor yeah. movements as well. Yeah, yeah, we do, uh, yeah. It refers to the our yoga teachers. I explained to them go to study a little bit of yantra yoga, and then do a little bit of breathing exercise, and then yeah, like uh, the breathing exercise is very useful to many like the physical and the mental uh, sort of like abnormal or disturbed things. Okay. Yeah. And Dr. Punzola will lead a practice af this afternoon, so we'll talk more about that. I hope I survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dr. Punzola, I have a question about um, what's the opinion or use of pharmaceuticals in Tibet, and then how does that work with uh, traditional Tibetan <coughs> medicine? Thank you. So this is one problem. Uh, this is a comes to the, the Tibetan medicine's a little bit uh, problems. Because Tibetan medicine, when we work with the people, we are not working on the symptoms. We are working, try to work on the root of the cause. Like an example, if someone is not sleeping, <clears throat> not sleeping is a symptom. 
like a way of the communicating to the doctor. But is that the root of that the cause of the not sleeping is different. Could be as a fire element, could be as a, the wind element. So first thing we try to search the, the root. So people who's taking like the Western pills, anti-depression, anti-this, anti-that, or painkiller. So once they're taking that the medicine, and then eight hours, 24 hours, whatever that certain hours, they, like the symptom is controlled, so we don't have the symptoms. So once we don't have the symptoms, it's not easy to recognize, because it's when we are make up time, we don't know what's exactly your skin colors, how many wrinkles we have, you know? So same as like that way, it's like the, the, the pills, is, which is great, really, it helps to people relieve the sufferings. I'm not saying this is the, the bed I'm not talking. It is very useful. It really is great to have that. But it comes to treat that the root of the, the issue is not helps. That way, the pills, is, once you started, the design of those pills is like the rest of your life, no? And the depression, and this, and that, is like a, the sense of beginning designed that pills the rest of the, your life. The Tibetan medicine is not that way. Tibetan medicine maximum is like a year, and then normally is three to six months, or three weeks. Because it's medicine, it became too body, too friend, and it doesn't work. So that's way is you start with one pill, Western medicine, and then you need to adding either your dosage, and then later you need also other medicines. So yeah, this that we're taking the Western um, certain like uh, pills is sometimes to causing to really find the cause or the root of the disease. Yeah. Thank you. So the, uh, the presentation started with a discussion of cancer treatment and how you could complement that with meditation and so forth. Would, I'm assuming the cancer treatment was probably chemotherapy or radiation or something like that. What would your reaction in Tibet be to those types of treatments if someone came to you and you discovered that they had cancer? And then split chat. Oh. Yes. Okay, so uh, the treatment, uh, when I'm working with the people who has cancer, <clears throat> and then particularly who's under the, the Western medicine protocol, I'm not worried so much about the disease at the moment, because as you are already working with the Western medicine that is strong enough. So at the moment, what we need is need a body, strong body. So that way is the, the Tibetan medicine, we try to support how to keep the physical strong, mentally strong, energy strong. So we try to work like, as we said, like the, through the diet, through the behavior, through the, like a certain supplement, we try to restrain the body system. And then uh, that will help to restrain that then down, what we said, glory. Yes. Yeah. And then uh, through that, and then try to prevent that the side effect disease or certain other contagious disease. So we try to maintain the body is uh, strong because uh, many people is not dying by the disease. Dying through the treatment is not really is dying from the, the, the disease. So as a treatment, there is available, treatment is available, but the body does not handle the treatment. Looks like it's like three years old, a baby having a big contraction, so like construct building something fell down on their body. Mm. You know, so that the, the treatment's too heavy to their body and then before the disease collapsed the, the life, and then the body collapsed their life. So for that reason, yes, when I work with those people, I try to mainly to maintain the physical body because it's a, <clears throat> Uh, I was one of the, uh, like the, the cancer, what we call survive. So I wasn't sure really I had that the disease, yes or no, I wasn't sure. Uh, sometime I couldn't believe I had that. But anyway, I want to test the, the chemotherapy because as there's many people comes to complain that I have no idea what's chemotherapy and what the chemotherapy side effects getting. 
So then I said, oh, this is a great opportunity for me to have a, like a free internship, you know? <laughs> really, if I really want to get an internship, chemotherapy, how I can get? No one will take me because I don't have like Western medicine background, this, that, you know? So I said, oh, this is a great moment for me to have a free internship. <laughs> and then plus is, you know, what they call like the... So I did that and then eight times what they, they need to be done. And then in the meantime, uh, I started to take the Tibetan supplement uh, like the two weeks before. That was that the only I had the time. And then I continued to take the Tibetan herbs after all the, the, the chemotherapy finished, everything I took the six months. And then uh, also, yeah, I enjoyed, really, I enjoyed the taking that the chemotherapy, many reasons I enjoyed. The first thing I enjoyed, the, how the, the great, the, the team, that the doctors were very capable, nurses were very capable. So I'm so appreciative, really, I have this opportunity. And the meantime is I did not get any side effect. Really, I did not get any side effect. Even I don't need to take that the medicines for the anti-nausea. I took the first two times because I didn't know what it is, what I'm taking. So then and I noticed this is anti for nausea. I said, no, I wouldn't take. I did not have any nausea and this, that. So all the list of the, the, the things I don't have. And then and the doctor and the nurse came. They said, you are so calm. How calm? How happened? I said, because I'm sleepy. <laughs> so yeah. This is really helped for me how to handle. So now I became sort of like an expert <laughs> in my Tibetan medicine community. If someone is having like a cancer patient, they call me, say, oh, I have someone, what I need to do. So then I tell them, okay, do this, that, that. So really, I'm grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, no, <laughs> Naomi, you had a question. Thank you. Yeah. You, have, you have a mic right there, no? Okay, they are. Okay, I wasn't sure. So, uh, thank you. Usually we, in the West, we talk about the mind-body connection, and then when we get to Tibetan Buddhism, we get this extra category, and which here we're calling speech on this panel, but also it was defined as speech and lung, and also tsel, energy. So uh, speech, <coughs> winds, and energy. And of course, we have this really hard time answering the question of what is the mind-body connection in the West. It's one of uh, a relatively unanswered question. Um, so I wanted, I wondered if you could help us to understand what is the relationship between speech and energy and breath. Uh, first of all, and then second of all, you have like on the stage there's a representation of people who works with this, these types of energy from the perspective of medicine, but also practice. And if you could, and, and this is to anyone, discuss how does one choose, you know, should we go to the meditation hospital or the yoga retreat or the real hospital? Yeah. Me? Okay. So, uh, so I think it all depends on, so first, the mind-body connection, I think, uh, uh, we've been talking about this, how, in a way, if we think of cell as the category of the larger category, energy as the larger category, in a way is that field of interaction of mind and body uh, could be seen as, as, as Lama Willa was saying earlier, the subtle body as could be uh, one of the kind of placeholders or holders of, 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 of that, uh, particularly with the, with the channels. And then the lung and the ngak, or the breath or, and the speech, are ways of expressing that interconnection. And, and most of the practices actually are uh, using, uh, when we use uh, mind-breath-body practices or mind-sound-body practices. So that would be one. In terms of um, what to use, I think it depends on you know, the person who, who's coming, what, what, is, what are their needs? But I think also one of the things that we were talking earlier and Ruth was mentioning when she was asked about the placebo, in a way, what are their beliefs, right? I mean, because there's, there is a sense of connection, of expectations. And actually now in many of our 
research, we measure expectation as, 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 a, as an important component. So, you know, what are they coming for? Where, where are they coming from? Like what Rinpoche was saying, you know, like it, it's, it's not just where you want to go, but where are you really? Because that determines what are the tools that are going to be helpful for you to get there. And so I think it, it really, it's an assessment in a way of where the person is, what are their needs, and what are the tools available in that particular place. Does that make sense? <laughs> so I think we're reaching our, um, our 90 minute mark, I believe. Uh, so we're uh, going to take a break and come back at what time for? Five o'clock for right? our meditation session. Okay, so in about 25 minutes, there will be a practice yeah, right. right here with Dr. Punso Uamo. And so thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much to our.